everyone is different. You're having a really bad day and things don't look right. Um, and you call the office and you say, I just don't know what to do anymore. I will tell you that that is not how it was meant to be. And it's not fair for you to go through life um, living a difficult life. But a lot of people that, that live in our parish don't realize that we're there or don't know that you don't have to have insurance to go there. You can go there and we work strictly on your income. You could pay $2 to come in and see a doctor, to see a therapist. We have an anxiety group. We have a parenting group. You would be very comfortable being there. You can come in and we can talk to you and we can comfort you. We can, we can be friends. We can understand. We can listen to what your problems are and what has caused you to, to feel the way that you feel. In the end, you would be very pleased that you ended up there. I've said it once before, but I'll say it again. It, it's, it's more fulfilling than anything else that that job could possibly give me by seeing a patient or a child or an adult's life completely turned around. That's a good day. Hi, my name is Lisa Lopez and I'm a nurse at the Ascension Counseling Center. Hello everyone, I'm Lisa Weber Curry, Manager of Clinical Services at Ascension Counseling Center. You're watching Ascension Counseling Center's video newsletter, where we talk about the services we offer and how you can benefit from them. Thanks for joining us. In this episode, we'll talk about healing life's deepest hurts. We'll explore why we carry the pains of childhood into adulthood how betrayed trust affects our adult relationships. We'll focus on the importance of forgiveness and what that means. Stay with us for the next half hour or so. We'll be right back after this message. Ascension Parish, a parish steeped in tradition. It's a place where generations of families have continued to enjoy a lifestyle that centers on community living and community celebration. It's a place where we care about each other and we care about ourselves. For more than 50 years, the Ascension Counseling Center has continued the tradition of helping individuals and families change behaviors and change lives. The Ascension Counseling Center. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. Hello, Suzanne. How are Hi, you Lisa. today? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good. Good. So today we're going to talk about healing life's deepest hurts and those emotional um, weights we carry around. Yeah, this is such an important topic. And uh, so we want to talk about how we can feel weighted down from things that hurt us or wound us from childhood. Okay. And, you know, what got me started thinking about this topic is a few months ago we we do a, an at the movies series at our church where we show a video clip and then we mm -hmm. talk about some kind of truth illustrated by the clip. Well, okay. we showed a clip from a movie of a man who had grown up with an abusive father. He was verbally and physically abusive. And okay. so they showed some of those scenes. And when I talked to the pastor afterward, he said, you could see that woundedness on people as they walked out of the building. Okay. Red eyes, crying, shoulders drooping. Mm -hmm. and, and so it made me start thinking about how we carry that woundedness from childhood wow. into our adulthood and it weights us down. And it be makes our life so very difficult and uh, become mm -hmm. a grudgery and a woundedness that we carry into our adult relationships yeah. and we don't even realize the cause right. of it. Right. It's not the relationship we're in currently. It's the woundedness that we take with us yeah. from childhood. So that, that it prevents us from opening up. So it's, it's yes. important to deal with it. We become afraid of being betrayed again. And, you know, we make all kind of unreasonable assumptions about the other person and right. what they're going to do to us. Right. And we never ever think it's coming from us no. within. So that's the important point here. So we're going to talk about how to change that going forward in 2019 since it's just around the corner. All right, so we are going to talk, first of all, our first point is about why do we carry the pain of childhood hurt and betrayal into adulthood? 
And so I want to talk about a couple of things, but the first one is about the trauma that we experience in childhood. And sometimes when we're exposed to a traumatic event, such as maybe a sexual assault or people who go through warfare, mm -hmm. um, there are people who are tortured, there are um, traffic accidents, traffic collisions, um, anything that feels like a threat to our safety okay. or security, or if we witness that happen right. to someone else, that can give us a post-traumatic stress reaction. Yeah. And so um, symptoms of uh, post-traumatic stress include having disturbing thoughts, disturbed feelings, um, having dreams, disturbing dreams about the event that occurred, recurring dreams, mm -hmm. um, having mental and physical distress, mental and physical symptoms that uh, are related to the trauma. And we call them trauma-related cues. A mm -hmm. trauma-related cue is some person, event, place, or thing that reminds us of the trauma. Right. So let's say, for instance, you're in an automobile accident on Interstate 10 at the Tanger Mall exit. All right, so if that happens, then you may be afraid to go by that location. Right. You may drive surface roads out of the way so that mm -hmm. you don't have to go by that spot where the accident right. was. Because it triggers those thoughts, it the triggers fear those thoughts comes and in feelings. again. And I know somebody yeah. that happened to, and she had her two daughters in the back seat, mm -hmm. and every time they had to pass by there, the daughters would become anxious. Do right. we have to come this way, Mommy? Right. You know, and so yes, if anything like that that happens to us is going to, it may cause a traumatic response right. so severe that it could classify as post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think it's important to remember, you pointed out, you do not have to be the person that experienced that That's event, right. but if you witness that event, it's just as traumatic for that person. So yes. that's important to remember. Yeah, and, and people who are the victims of some type of assault, they mm -hmm. are probably going to have a stronger traumatic response right. than something else maybe. Exactly. And like even things like uh, watching um, the buildings collapse at 9-11, yeah. seeing film of, of bodies falling from the sky, yeah. people have been traumatized by that. Locally, a lot of people were traumatized by the flood of mm -hmm. 2016. Yes. Uh, we, uh, people lost all their furniture, they lost their homes, they lost beloved uh, mm -hmm. belongings right. and photos uh, that they can never get things back. that can never yeah. be replaced and so a lot of people and you know what we've noticed is that we we have people an increase of people coming into the clinic with anxiety responses and they don't connect it back to the flood but when we ask them how long has this been going on and they say two years right we know it's probably to the trauma flood. from right. the flood uh, affecting them and the thing about PTSD is that it may not show up for three months mm -hmm. to up to two years after the event. So if that happens, if this shows up two years after an event, you are not necessarily going to connect no. the trauma or the anxiety to that event. Right. It's very hard to connect very it. It is, and that's mm -hmm. where a professional can do you a lot exactly. of good. Uh, and so it may not develop for a little while, making mm -hmm. it hard to determine wow. that it's related to that trauma. Um, and PTSD actually causes f chemical changes in our body mm -hmm. and in our brain in terms of how we think and how we respond right. to things. So it is something. Now, what I want to point out about PTSD is it really doesn't have a clock or a calendar. So it's not like some of the emotions that you have, like grief or loss mm -hmm. or sadness. Some of those just get better over time. Mm -hmm. PTSD doesn't get better over time unless it has a direct intervention. And right. so you really do have to directly address it. It's not yeah. necessarily going to go away. Right, it can actually get worse it over can time get worse. if left unattended to. And that's why your childhood trauma is going to follow you into adulthood. Right. If it's not dealt with, it's going to stick there. Right. And other trauma will pile on top of it <coughs> and it will become compounded. 
instead of right. getting better. And it just makes it harder to dig yourself out of it. Absolutely. Again, professional help can make a difference. It makes a difference. Okay. And I like the term digging out of it because mm -hmm. it does imply that there's just a ton of stuff dropped, right. dropped on top of us. Exactly. And that's how we feel yeah. so often. Yeah, we feel covered in it. Right. Now, the other reason that childhood woundedness follows us into adulthood is, be is because of maturation. Okay. You getting older and maturing. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes through that. They develop more and more abilities physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, the older you get. Mm -hmm. So I have a friend who has a brand new grandbaby, not you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, a friend who has a brand new grandbaby, and mm -hmm. they sent us a video of the baby turning over. Mm -hmm. And the baby turned over, and everybody in the room yelled and clapped. Yes. Okay? So... My point is, when you are laying on the sofa watching football and you take a nap and you turn over, does anybody yell and applaud for you? No. <laughs> nope. It's not a developmental task. It's something you mastered as an infant. So whenever it's something new, we note it. And whenever it's something old, we, we don't. ignore it. And it, it's the same way, like if you've ever been to an elementary school, they mm -hmm. have these colored lines, purple lines or whatever, painted from the classroom down the hall and into the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. When the kids are in elementary school, they have to line up in a line, follow the line painted on the wall, right. get into the cafeteria. Because that's age appropriate right. for and their developmental their, stage. Their, their, their they need that outside structure. Right. But you are never going to find lines painted on the floor in high school or high With school adults. kids go into the cafeteria <laughs> right. in a line. And that has to do with our developmental mm -hmm. abilities. So the reason this is important for us is because every developmental age that we get to where our brain or our emotions develop more fully, when we look back on that childhood traumatic event, we reinterpret it with mm -hmm. our new awareness and our right. new intelligence. And we begin to see how significant it was. So maybe mm -hmm. I don't realize how significant a sexual Assault abuse was, was yeah. at age four or at age seven. But as you're getting older and older, you begin to realize how inappropriate that is, how society looks at that, and you know how painful that is and and how that's considered deviant on the part mm -hmm. of the person who does it as your awareness grows you reinterpret that event and mm -hmm. so you are going to feel some pain from that event at every one of those maturation points mm -hmm. as you work through it again and so you begin to see the real depth of that violation mm -hmm. That I you think experience. that's when you begin to connect what may have happened years ago is still affecting mm -hmm. my life today. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, I knew a, uh, a woman <clears throat> in college, and she r reported that uh, she was sexually abused by her brother mm -hmm. throughout most of her teenage <clears throat> years up until she was 15 or 16. And she said she knew she didn't like it. She knew it was painful. She didn't want it to happen. Right. But she didn't know that that didn't happen in everybody's family. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until she went to college that she found out that that didn't happen right. in everybody's family. So now she has a new awareness, mm -hmm. a new insight about that event, and she has to reprocess it with this newness. Right. That's why things <coughs> are going to follow us from childhood to adulthood. Those two reasons, if it's PTSD, it mm -hmm. won't go away on its own, and reinterpreting the event through each developmental maturation stage right. in our life. Because reinterpreting it actually brings that trauma back into your Absolutely. life. You re-experience it. Mm -hmm. So now you have to deal with it. So maturation serves an important point in our lives. It's something important to make us aware of what has happened to mm -hmm. us. And again, counselors can help you create a safe environment yes. to reprocess all of these things. So you're not yes. going to come in and we're not going to let you fall apart. We are going to help you yeah. take to be it able step to by it. step. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's the first point. Why do childhood 
traumas follow us into mm -hmm. adulthood. The second thing I'd like for us to look at is, you know, I want us to understand how early betrayals in our life um, destroy trust right. and how that betrayed trust affects us in our current relationships with mm -hmm. others. All right. Okay. So the first <coughs> thing is we want to understand a little bit about how trust is created. Right. You know, we talked a little bit about maturation and development, mm -hmm. and most of us get that concept. In fact, right. most of us understand like what happens with ducks when they imprint on their mother and then they just follow her around in a line, right. two little ducklings. Um, but we've all seen the videos about ducks who've imprinted on dogs or, mm -hmm. you know, geese right. or, you know, and that was what they did. They imprinted, that was their time to learn, this is mother. Well. Mm -hmm. As human beings, we have a specific time to learn, I can trust. The world is a safe place, mm -hmm. it's going to meet my needs. And if we don't learn that, then it's very difficult for us to learn to trust other people. So we're not mm -hmm. born trusting. Just like we're not born knowing how to walk, no. you know, to the cafeteria without right. a line. You know, yeah. to show we us how. We have to be taught. We have to be taught. We have to learn that. So how do we learn trust? Trust is developed in infancy. One of the first things we're supposed to learn as human beings is trust. And by trust, we mean we learn that the people in our lives, our caregiver, is consistent and reliable in meeting Gosh. our needs. And so that person is dependable and we learn the world is a safe place for right. us. Exactly. And the way we learn that is our caregiver, whoever that is, it doesn't have to be our birth parents, mm -hmm. could be anybody else, but somebody else, every time we cry as an infant, that person is there mm -hmm. to take care of dirty diapers, hunger, being cold, being ill, having colic, whatever it is, they are there reliably and they take care of us. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had a parent who is depressed, could take care of you some days and other days couldn't get out of bed mm -hmm. and left you overnight, then you might have trouble developing trust because yeah. you're not having that consistent, that need met on a consistent mm -hmm. basis. Right, so if, that, that makes for an unstable childhood. It does, yes. it absolutely does. Mm -hmm. and. The other thing that it does is if you have some a caregiver and they're not there. Now this mm -hmm. happens a lot. There's a lot of grandparents raising grandchildren. Yes. And the reason they're doing this is because their children, the parents of their grandchildren, are missing in action. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have substance abuse issues, mental health abuse issues. We meet a lot of children that were just almost abandoned by their mm -hmm. parents. I've worked with children who have been left alone in the home for three days, yes. and as toddlers had to feed themselves, mm -hmm. children in this situation are gonna find it very hard to trust. Now, why don't they learn to trust when the next person comes along and takes good care of them? Mm -hmm. Very hard. Again, it's similar to PTSD in the sense that you have to have specific interventions designed to increase trust. Because remember, mm -hmm you have a certain specific imprinted time to learn trust, and that's as an infant. And if you miss that, you've missed yeah. it. And so you yeah. have to work really hard to learn how to trust. And yes. so you're gonna come into adulthood with trust difficulties, and mm -hmm. it's going to carry through in your current relationships. It does, and it, like you said, it starts in childhood. That's where we see clients coming in with attachment issues mm -hmm. because they have not securely attached to someone they can trust. And when they do, as in the example you gave with the grandparents raising the kids, they don't want to leave grandma's side mm -hmm. or grandpa's side because they know in the past when a parent walked away, they may have never seen them again. Again, that's right. So. And they'll learn, like even though they're in a safe situation, they still remember that trauma. And so they will, like with one family I worked with, they were living with the grandmother, mm -hmm. but they had been the ones left alone in the trailer for several mm -hmm. days. 
they, even though they were in a sa stable situation and they knew it, they could acknowledge it, right. they would still hoard food. Yes, so they would take food and so we had to work with that. Mm -hmm. And so you're still going to have some things that are going to carry over because they still could not trust that anybody or the universe was going to meet their need for right. hunger. And it takes a lot of patience working with individuals who have not been able to secure trust as a young kid. As a provider of services, you have to be really patient. As family members, Absolutely. you have to be really patient with mm -hmm. those kids because it's a learning process. They have to unlearn Everything. what they knew before yeah. and learn now you have someone in your life you can trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for a lot of people that's difficult. It is. All right. So that's one of the reasons if we miss our trust window, mm -hmm. you know, we're, uh, maybe it's going to be hard for us to, to develop that. But when we come into adulthood, depending on our trust experiences, mm -hmm. we have two different things. So okay. I become a person, I can either trust others or I cannot. I'm in one of those areas. Yes. I trust or I cannot trust. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm in a relationship with somebody else. So, if I'm in a relationship with you, mm -hmm. you're somebody who's either trustworthy mm -hmm. or not trustworthy. Right. And we can have any kind of four combinations. So, mm -hmm. that's going on in every one of your relationships right now. You're somebody who can trust or not trust. Mm -hmm. And you're in a relationship with somebody who is either trustworthy or not trustworthy. So here's how that plays out in your relationships. Okay. If I'm someone who's able to trust others mm -hmm. and you are trustworthy, mm -hmm. we are golden. Okay. We have no problems. Right. I can trust you. You're mm -hmm. trustworthy. You don't mm -hmm. betray my trust. Mm -hmm. And so we have a great relationship. Okay. But I can be somebody who trusts mm -hmm. and you could be somebody untrustworthy. Okay. You may be betraying me left and right. You're having affairs. You are mm -hmm. not where you say you are. Right. You're spending money behind my back. Mm -hmm. You're spreading uh, every secret I tell you. Right. You're not trustworthy, but I am still trusting you. Okay. Now, here's everybody what happens. You blame that other person. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're always being wounded. Your task is to recognize that you don't understand or know how to find safe people. Mm -hmm. All right, so yes. you have to be able to switch into trust safe people, the trustworthy people, and do not trust right. untrustworthy. So that it's not like a, a black and white either or. You are basically at heart a trusting person, mm -hmm. but you have to recognize when people come along who don't deserve it, who mm -hmm. will violate your trust. So if you are trusting and you're in a relationship with somebody who's untrustworthy, they will always betray you and you will always be hurt. And that's mm -hmm. your issue, not theirs. And I'm mm -hmm. saying this to you With all in kindness. <laughs> yes. So that person is not going to change. You can't badger them too. Mm -hmm. They may not be able to be trustworthy if they have trust issues that they developed mm -hmm. in childhood. Right. So it's if I'm unable to trust, mm -hmm. I am not going to wait for you to meet my needs. I am going to meet all my needs on my own mm -hmm. and not, you know, care yeah. about you because no, who's going to take care of me but me? Right. You know. Right. Because you've been responsible for you since childhood. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it's, and it's not about us doubting our ability to trust others. It's more about us recognizing, as you said, whether that person we're interacting with is trustworthy or not. Absolutely. And whether or not we're going to remain in a relationship with someone we can't trust. So that we have to look at that and make mm -hmm. a decision yes. on that. So the first two combinations, <clears throat> I can trust and you're trustworthy. Good situation. Mm -hmm. The other one is, I can trust and you're not trustworthy. I'm going to continue to be betrayed. Right. Now, on the other side of that, I may not be able to trust mm -hmm. other people. Right. But if I'm in a relationship with you, you might be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trusting somebody who's worthy of trust. Right. That's a relationship that's going to wound the other person. Because... Yes you can't prove so much that you're trustworthy. Yeah. You know, 
That's true. You, you can demonstrate it, but that again has nothing to do with the trustworthy person. And this is what I want you to see as well. The other person, so I know people that they want the other person to account for everywhere they've been. And when that person does that, they still don't believe them. Right. You know, it's not about you, the trustworthy person. It's about the other person not developing trust when they were supposed mm -hmm. to and having difficulty with it now. Just know that you as a trustworthy person, you don't have to put yourself in that situation where you have to prove everything because it's really, it's not about you and what you're doing. It's about the other person not being able yeah. to trust and therefore there's nothing you can do to change that. And so again, like Lisa says, you have to look at, is this a relationship I should keep? Right, because right. it doesn't get better it's until really the not. other person works on the issues. On the issues, but hate. what they're gonna be doing is mm -hmm. blaming you. They're gonna right. want you to prove that you really are trustworthy. And that's, mm -hmm. you know. It, it's not possible, especially if you've been doing this and showing up and being consistent over the years and nothing has changed, it's time yes. to take a look at that. And plus the other thing that's hard about that is, mm -hmm. if I want you, if I accuse you of doing something and you haven't done it, you can't prove you didn't do something, right. you know? Exactly. I mean, you can prove you did something, but you can't really, so it's, it's so difficult, it puts you in a difficult mm -hmm. position. And you basically spend your life having to, you know, accommodate that other person's right. inability to trust. Right. So there's, you know, I can't trust, but you're trustworthy. Mm -hmm. The other, the final piece is, I can't trust, and you're not trustworthy. Right. This is a disaster. <laughs> chaos. <laughs> this yeah. is total chaos in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so you really need to look at, again, do you want to keep this? Right. So I don't trust you, and you don't deserve trust. And, you know, so... There's um, no proving anything in that. Mm -hmm. That's where both parties need to individually seek counseling. Yes, individually. Yes. And mm -hmm. so those are the four ways that trust, whether it was developed or not, are going to impact your current relationships. I can trust and you're trustworthy. I can trust and you're not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. I cannot trust and you're trustworthy, mm -hmm. and I cannot trust and you are not trustworthy. Right. right. So, so how do we move on? How do we change the dynamics in trust? Glad you asked that. Okay. An important piece, I know you're gonna roll your eyes when I say this, because we hear this so often, mm -hmm. forgiveness. Yes. Forgiveness is something you do for yourself. Right. You release the pain instead of carrying it with you. Exactly. So now, and when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about your current relationships. Mm -hmm. We are again going back to your childhood. Someone has betrayed you, wounded you, and you've never been able to heal from that hurt. Mm -hmm. You have to heal, and the only way you can heal is to forgive that. You do that for your own benefit, to get rid of the weight. Right. You don't do that for the other person's benefit. They are not suffering because you have not forgiven them. They are not going to suffer or be happy no. because you do forgive them. Mm -hmm. They are going to be who they are regardless of your. And it's not about waiting for the other person to repent and ask for forgiveness. Because honestly, truly, people who didn't know that it was inappropriate to sexually abuse a child are kind of never going to get it. They're going to, every time people come in and talk about, you know, violence that they were arrested for, they never own up to what they did. Mm -hmm. They always minimize it. Yeah, I didn't really do that. And you read the police report and it's, well, you know, she came in the door with a knife. It wasn't wow. at all. So they minimize their portion of it, what mm -hmm. they did, and they blame the other person or they blame someone else. And really, if they had that ability, they would change that and they would be remorseful and they would ask for your forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if we're waiting for somebody to come to their senses and ask for forgiveness, they just don't have it in them to be able right. to do that. And so it's a lot of times about, do I want to continue a relationship with this mm -hmm. person? 
And so I'm not talking about the really serious things like abuse, but you know, the average betrayals that go on every year mm -hmm. in families or the offenses that we get or the words that we say, uh, the unreliability. With those kind of things, we just need to ask ourselves, do I want to keep a relationship with my yeah. parent, with my sibling, with my friend? And if the answer is yes, then forgiveness has to come on your it's part. It's a requirement. It really is a requirement. It's, it makes me it just, I remember Oprah saying that forgiveness for her, when she finally understood it, was when she looked at it this way. Forgiveness is giving up any hope that the situation could have been any different. Yes. Because you can't change it by holding on to the anger. You mm -hmm. forgive and you move on from it. But I think the part that gets people tripped up is, oh, so are you requesting that I also forget what happens? And that's not a part no. of it. We're not saying that you must forget, but you forgive because forgiveness is truly for the person who's given the forgiveness. It releases you. You can actually move on from the situation. Yes, and if we think about those four things <coughs> about trust, being able to trust and somebody being a trustworthy, this person who's offended you or abused you as a child, let me just solve the question, that is an untrustworthy person. Don't trust that person. Right. Uh, so that's an untrustworthy person. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to trust them. So we're not talking about that. Right. So we're just talking about forgiveness. And, and I love what you said about, you know, about forgiveness there. Uh, because really, one of the aspects of us being able to fig forgive somebody else is to mm -hmm. feel compassion. We don't think about that word very often. Mm -hmm. So really, compassion is feeling sympathetic pity mm -hmm. or concern for the kindness, caring, and, or, I'm sorry, if someone, so this is when you show kindness right. or caring or a willingness to help others. Um, that's compassion. Mm -hmm. And you, compassion and anger cannot coexist. Right. So compassion is really about being able to find something in that other person or in that other situation mm -hmm. that helps you to understand it right. in, in the terms of walk a mile in my shoes. Mm -hmm. Now, w I know that there's, there's nothing, there's a lot of different levels of offenses. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about child abuse, most reasonable people know that that's correct and are appall appalled by it Mm -hmm. and offended by it mm -hmm. and would want to ostracize the person right. who would do it. So I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, but if you think about it, we have all betrayed somebody mm -hmm. else, said something hurtful to somebody right. else, let somebody else down mm -hmm. in some level. And right. it may be very small, but you just cannot live your life with people and not offend each other. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Exactly. You know? it, it, so yeah. it's about looking at that other person with compassion and saying, here's how I have failed. Mm -hmm. And maybe they, if you, you can look, maybe they were abused. Maybe they, who knows, maybe they have limited intelligence, mm -hmm. maybe something to where if we can look at uh, the, the phrase wounded people, wound people. Mm -hmm. And if we can find where the person who has betrayed us is wounded, yeah. we can begin to feel compassion for right. them and that compassion as compassion grows anger decreases mm -hmm. so partly it's about finding compassion in that act or in that behavior and, it, and I think it's important to remember if we give compassion because life is about give and take life is about what you put out is what you get back so if we extend compassion to somebody else when we're in need of that compassion, it will come back to us. Yes. So, you know, even if it's hard for us to do it initially, if we just remember that, extend compassion to somebody else, because there will, as long as we're alive on this earth, come a time when we're going to need that compassion back. So if we extend it out, we may not get it from the person we're extending it to, but somewhere down the line, somebody's going to give it back to us. Mm -hmm. So if we just hang on to that, we can really give yes. compassion. Yes. Yeah. And you know, an example of how that might work, because sometimes that helps. You know, I've talked with somebody and, and they, I have to be, if I'm going somewhere, I have to be there 15 minutes early. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and not everybody looks at it at that time. Mm -hmm. They think they're on time if they're right. 15 minutes early. Other people think they're on time if they're there mm -hmm. <laughs> when the event starts, and other people think they're on time if they're there 10 minutes late. Before you know, the everybody main event. absolutely yeah. <laughs> before the preaching starts. Mm -hmm. I'm good, you know. Um, and so, the the person who really wants to be there 15 minutes early mm -hmm. will start nagging everybody, and that really annoys mm -hmm. everybody. It can be very irritating, but. Mostly if you look at like somebody who likes to be there 15 minutes early, if I ask them what's going on with that, they'll feel, they'll say, I have a lot of anxiety. Right. Or my, my father made me this way. He uh -huh. would do this. And my mother was l slower. And there would always be arguments about time and getting. Right. So if you start looking at what kind of causes that behavior, mm -hmm. thinking about that, if they don't get there early they get anxiety because mm -hmm. it reminds them of right. arguments in their childhood home remember we talked about trauma related cues mm -hmm. being latest could be a trauma related right. cue for them so if you think they're trying to avoid memories of that trauma mm -hmm. you're going to interpret that differently than if you think you're just so ocd and controlling right and you you know and, exactly. and if you think about those two things, if that's how you interpret the other person, you're going to have vastly different responses to that nagging mm -hmm. about time. Just so, in other words, sometimes take the time to walk in someone else's shoes. Absolutely. Yeah. It gives us an understanding of why that person is behaving the way they do. We don't have to agree with it, but at least we have an understanding. Absolutely. Right. Now we want to wrap up our discussion on forgiveness by saying forgiveness of another person is not the same as reconciliation. Mm -hmm. You forgive them again for your own benefit, but you do not, does not mean that you have to establish a relationship with them. If they have not repented, recognized what they did was wrong, mm -hmm. apologized, uh, change their behavior, change what they're doing, anything like that. Accept they don't expect uh, accept yeah. the responsibility. Then do not have a relationship with them. Right. It's perfectly okay to split holidays up and not be there when that person is there. Exactly. Uh, it's perfectly okay not to go to that person's house if everybody else is going. Right. It's perfectly okay not to call that person and invite them somewhere because your mama wants you to, right. you know. And so you do not, you, forgiveness absolutely doesn't equal mm -hmm. reconciliation. Right. And in fact, you should not reconcile with that person until they acknowledge what they did, accept responsibility for it, and change that behavior, yes. make amends to you for what they did. Right. And so you know, that they are still, until they do that, they're still in that I'm untrustworthy box. And mm -hmm. you need to leave them in that box, mm -hmm. not be in that box with them. That's right. And remember, you have a choice. We don't have to be in that box because our family member says, hey, we all need to be together. It's the holidays. If you're not comfortable, don't get in that box again. Absolutely. We have choice. And now, sometimes people have trouble with the that um, compassion and that understanding mm -hmm. part when they're trying to forgive. Again, that is one of the roles of a really good counselor is to give right. you that alternate perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I had a client one time and they had been married. They were in their 70s. They had been married 40 years and she found out her husband had an affair. Mm -hmm. And she came in to see me and she said, I, I really want to stay in the marriage, but I can't rationalize it. I can't mm -hmm. figure out how to get over this and, and, right. and stay in the marriage. And so I said to her, well, you understand that bad people do good things and good people mm -hmm. do bad things and that no one behavior is the sum total of what that person's character is right. or their personality is. She's had 40 years to look at it. And if more good outweighed mm -hmm. that one character flaw at that time. Absolutely. She said, I'm good. I got it never had to come back. Okay. Counselors Great. can do that for you because exactly. we're not emotionally involved yeah. uh, and we're, we're an, a neutral third party and we have that kind of experience to be able to exactly. help people with that. Exactly. 
Well, again, Suzanne, another great topic, especially with the New Year's coming around yes. and we all make resolutions. So let's make that resolution. Heal ourselves from within, and we're yes. here to help you if you need that healing. So thanks again, Suzanne. You're welcome. And thanks to you, our viewers, for spending your time with us for this episode of Ascension Counseling Center's video newsletter. Remember, you can catch replays of the program exclusively on Ascension 21 on the days and times listed on your screen and anytime on Ascension 21's YouTube channel. We hope today's information will help change your life for the better. That's yeah. our goal at Ascension Counseling Center for our programs to help change lives. Remember, Ascension Counseling Center is here by way of your support. We're funded by a two mil property tax millage, which means that $2 from every $1,000 you pay in taxes goes to support our agency so we can provide free and low cost mental health and substance abuse outpatient services to residents of Ascension. We're located in Gonzales at 1112 Southeast Ascension Complex Boulevard off Worthy Road, across from the courthouse and next to the health unit. You can reach us by calling 225-450-1016. You can also find us on the web at ascensionparish.net forward slash mh and on Facebook at Ascension Counseling Center. You can also hear us on KKAY AM 1590 every Tuesday from 10 to 10.30 a.m. Thanks for your support, and until next time, from everyone at Ascension Counseling Center, thank you for watching. We see a lot of, parent, a lot of children that are actually um, being raised by their grandparents. There are so many resources that we can help you with to, to help you figure out what to do with this child, to help this child understand what his goal in life is. Having one little boy come in and, and hate his life and have a scowl on his face and not want to be there and then um, a month or so later befriend him and come in and smile at me and talk to me and give me a hug. which. Those children don't do that very often, so by, by having that hug rewards me more than any paycheck that a person could give me. It, it, it's more fulfilling than anything else that that job could possibly give me by seeing a patient or a child or an adult's life completely turned around. Hi, my name is Lisa Lopez and I'm a nurse at the Ascension Counseling Center.